Yes, I, I, I believe we need more gardeners in the world, uh, perhaps more than architects. That's why I, this is the first time I, I highlight the name with green, but in this case is probably appropriate because he was he worked with with green matter, with uh, with nature. So Friedrich Frederick Law Olmsted, born in 1822 and died in 1903, and uh, he was born on uh, April uh, 26. Um, as you see, he was considered and is considered the father of American landscape architecture, not a little thick. And I think he looks like an interesting man, an intense man, and he was quite, quite busy doing a lot of works. This is really a, a, short, a short presentation on him but uh, we, we pay homage to him even in this way. So Fr Frederick Law Olmsted was an American landscape architect, journalist, social critic, and public administrator. He was the father of American landscape architecture. Olmsted was famous for co-designing many well-known urban parks with his senior partner, Calvert Vaux, a Frenchman. One of Olmsted's early works included designing the Walnut Hill Park in New Britain, Connecticut. His later efforts included Central Park and Prospect Park in New York City and Cadwallader Park in Trenton. He headed the preeminent landscape architecture and planning consultancy of late 19th century America, which was carried on and expanded by his sons. Frederick and John C. under the name Olmsted Brothers. Daniel Burnham, uh, the Chicago architect, said of him, of Olmsted, he paints with lakes and wooded, wooded, wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountain sides and ocean views. Quite a painting uh, material. So, um, happy birthday to him. And uh, I do believe that uh, we live at a time when, when uh, we need badly, badly, badly uh, nature and we need badly, badly, badly gardeners. Maybe so much so that I would say that maybe it's bet best today to, when we have to do a project, to start with what is around the building and not with the building. Because, uh, because of various reasons, the climate change, the, pollution uh, and uh, we destroyed a lot of nature and a man like him was trying to uh, to to restore something that even at that time in during his time maybe needed needed attention um, a special man an interesting man you can read about him of course on the web um, and uh, he, he, any of you is interested in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, landscape uh, architecture? He's certainly uh, someone to be uh, very very seriously considered. Some drawings, meaning some plans that he did for his uh, large uh, parks that he designed. Sorry about the resolution for this one. Uh, this is uh, uh, Central Park uh, in uh, in New York City. Um, a very famous park and uh, a very welcome large, large, large oasis in the center of Manhattan. Well, in the northern, northern part of Manhattan. This is Prospect Park in Brooklyn, New York. We are going to look at also at images of, of these parks, but you can, you can already uh, observe the, 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 the intricate and visceral almost uh, uh, curves of the pathways that he designed and it's it's he was extremely skilled and sensitive to what uh, is called uh, landscape uh, landscape architecture again uh, um, uh, central park uh, and uh, yeah i think we can find inspiration in the work of of of, of someone like him and we could also find inspiration in the works of uh, André Le Notre, the great uh, gardener of Louis, uh, the Sun King, Louis Le Soleil. OK, 
Okay, we begin with Central Park uh, in New York City. Uh, I'll show some images of, of eight parks that he designed. Maybe the word design is, but no, it, it, it can still be used. Uh, but the, the, the willfulness of the architect or the planner or the designer is maybe less apparent in the case of uh, of a park because there the, the building material, so to speak, is, is natural and is growing. So in 1857, a rising young architect from London named Calvert Vaux, that he was of French origin, asked Olmsted to join him in preparing an entry for the Central Park competition. It was a competition for, for uh, what to do in, 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 in that area. At the time, Olmsted was serving as the first superintendent of Central Park, a position that Vo assumed would give Olmsted unique knowledge of the topography. Olmsted had never submitted a design for a public park before, but their submission known as the Green's World Plan was exceptional in its creativity and beauty, says Petri. I don't know who Petri is. Uh, like so many of us do, uh, Olmsted and Vo worked up to the very last second to submit the design. And indeed, anyone who works for a competition or for any kind of uh, project that has a deadline is about the same thing. You work until the last second. The Frederick Law Olmsted papers note that when they arrived to submit their plan, the offices were closed and they had to rouse the janitor and leave the, their submission with him. Beautiful, a, a moving uh, anecdote. As it turns out, their presentation was inspired. It included before and after views that allowed the commissioners to envision what the park would look like after Olmsted and Vaux had completed their work. There were to be passages of open space as well as more rugged terrain, says Petri, anticipating that New York City would one day be a large metropolis both Vo and Olmsted planned to have heavy planting around the edges of the park to exclude the sights and sounds of the future city and to provide visitors a restorative and peaceful place. And here it is, a very famous park indeed, in a very famous uh, city. And uh, you know, just, just this picture shows the, the, the immense impact that this man had and his partner on, on this city. Uh, I crossed this park many times. I, uh, I, I, I love Central Park and uh, uh, it's, it's done very, very sensitively here. The building that you see here is uh, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is, um, I mean, you know, I can spend uh, some time just, just commenting on what we see here. John Lennon was killed somewhere here on the Upper West Side. I forgot exactly where the Dakota building is, must be somewhere around here, but facing the park on the West Side. And now here, this is an older picture. There are uh, very, very tall and sometimes slim to uh, towers. Um, so this is an older picture. This is the Upper East Side. This is the Upper West Side. This is Hudson River. And Manhattan goes all the way. And at the end is uh, Wall, Wall, Wall Street. Uh, so look at this, you know, it's, 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 it's really a very visceral work, if we could use this word. And uh, it's very rich. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's organic and it's, I mean, it's not that I think, I see it is organic. And I, I don't know exactly what inspired him or them when they did this design, but it, I, I feel it's still very contemporary, so to speak. It's not, you know, maybe anything in nature is so-called contemporary because it's alive, it grows. And in, in, the, in the spring, it, it comes back to, to being alive. But here we are talking about pathways, uh, you know, about roads, about all kinds of things. And the design is very, you know, fluid. And uh, I think uh, they had great intuitions then in mid 19th century when they designed it. This is an old picture indeed. Uh, 
of uh, of the of the park now i am pay had his office somewhere here um, uh, in a building uh, close to close to the park um, from what i remember i don't know exactly the address but it's not so important and this is the empire state building and anyway um, It is remarkable that this man in the 19th century, together with his partner, I don't, I imagine Olmsted had, was the, the main designer there, but I don't know for sure. In a way, their vision or his vision was, was uh, comprehensive enough to, to accommodate uh, the future developments of, of, of the city on one hand, but also the future changes or, or I don't know, I cannot truly use the word again, developments, the changes in the mentality of people. It's, 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 a, it's a visionary work in a way. And uh, I think this, this vision, if we are to call it so, derives from a deep understanding of what nature is. It's truly a great, great, great gift they gave to this uh, important city indeed. This is a recent picture because you see the girls uh, seem to have uh, masks against the pandemic. But the picture is taken in, uh, in Central Park. The moving picture. Now, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, um, a smaller park, but a beautiful park. And I, I know it firsthand. I, I biked in that park and I walked in that park. I'll read a few words about it designed by Olmsted and Calvert Vaux in the mid 19th century. Uh, this uh, green space first opened to the public in 1867 when it was only partially built and was later de designated a scenic, a scenic landmark by the City Landmarks Preservation Commission in 1975. Today, Prospect Park, nicknamed Brooklyn's Backyard, welcomes more than 10 million visitors each year to enjoy concerts at its band shell, a zoo, children's playground equipment, pedal boats on the picturesque lake, and miles of roads for joggers, walkers, and cyclists. It's a great example of the landscape architect's pastoral style, which can be seen in the marvelous 75-acre long meadow. It is open green space, says, again, this mysterious Petri, mysterious for me, with small bodies of water and scattered trees and groves designed to be soothing to the eye and to be restorative in spirit. Here it is, uh, another beautiful, in my opinion, a beautiful, I mean, just graphically looking at it, I would gladly put something like this on the wall. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very sensitively and richly uh, designed and people enjoy it. I remember when I crossed it, there were many people there, you know, laying on the grass with dogs or without dogs. And uh, somehow his parks had this power to, to, to bring people together, as you can well see. Now these uh, could be sometimes, especially in the evening, a little bit dangerous. Uh, I remember I had, I tried to avoid them, but, uh, and it's possible to avoid them. Now, uh, a park in, in Boston, Emerald Necklace, uh, this winding network of green spaces stretching across the city of Boston consists of the Arnold Arboret Arboretum, Franklin Park and Back Bay Fence. The verdant expanses, each referred to as one of the necklace jewels, feels like its own distinctive and natural landscape. And that's on purpose. Olmsted's vision of city parks being sanctuaries from the clamor and greed of urban life is played out as you travel the seven mile long series of meadows, marshlands and roadways. When Olmsted successfully 
apply this design theory to New York City Central Park, Boston took note and eventually hired him in the 1870s to build not just one large park, but an entire park system where Bostonians could easily go when the day's work is done and where they may stroll for an hour seeing, hearing, and feeling nothing of the bustle and jar of the streets. By 1895, after about 20 years of work, Olmsted was finished. So it was not a, you know, a, an easy job, 20 years. He went on to settle in Brookline in 1883, opening offices for the country's first landscape architecture firm in his home and continuing to work on the city's chain of parks. And here are uh, other images from uh, Boston. And I, I, he had a very, very intuitive uh, and, uh, as I said, organic way of, of, of designing these parks. And how else could they be, in fact? You know, you cannot uh, use the T-square and the rectangle when you design a park. Although the French sometimes are good at that kind of gardening. But this is uh, North America and uh, too much the T-square and the rectangle were used uh, when designing the city. So. By contrast, the park had to be different, and it is different. Uh, at least it was very different as designed by uh, Olmsted. Baltimore Estate, uh, Biltmore Estate, sorry. Uh, the, the, this, I, I knew nothing about it and I still don't know, but I discovered a very interesting side of, of, of North America. In fact, you wonder, is it North America? You'll see pictures. The three mile approach road stretching from Biltmore Village to Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina is no accident. It's the result of a very intentional and complex design by Olmsted that showcases a perfect blend of forest and landscape with no hard edges to separate the two, and an intentional lack of long-range views, explains Parker and is director of horticulture on the Biltmore website. The approach road is the first important garden and landscape feature you see on the estate, giving visitors a true feel for Olmsted's skill. He used native plant materials as the basis for his plan, adding 10,000 rhododendrons as a background element for the road. He also used mountain rolls, uh, laurels, native and Japanese Andromeda and other plants. Evergreens in the foreground add richness, delicacy, delicacy and mystery, while varieties of river cane and bamboo offer a hint of the exotic and tropical. He placed low growing plants along the brook and edge of the drive. For a variety of color in the winter, he used hardy, hardy olives, evergreens with an olive tint, junipers and red cedars and, and yews, all to create the complexity of light and shadow that define a picturesque style. Uh, as we, can, we, we, we listened, uh, as, we, as I read, uh, you know, it's a complex art and uh, you know, it, it, it is an art that changes in time, so it, it needs care. Uh, he was, and, and he deserves more attention. This is just an incipient uh, an introduction to, uh, to, to, his, uh, to his work. Here you can see a more formal kind of gardening, you would say, kind of inspired by the, by the French. And the building itself uh, seems to be French, doesn't it? Very much so. The Mount Royal in Montreal in Canada uh, began in, in 1874. Montreal's Mount Royal was the first park Olmsted designed after he and Vo dissolved their partnership. In an effort to emphasize the area's mountainous topography, Olmsted decided to make the mountain more mountainous through the use of exaggerated vegetation, such as shade trees at the bottom of the carriage path that climbs the mountain, so it would resemble a valley. The vegetation would get sparser as the visitor went higher and higher 
completing the illusion of exaggerated height. Olmsted wanted to install a grand mountain, pasture, and lake, but the city decided on a reservoir instead, so Olmsted planned a grand promenade around it. Unfortunately, the city of Montreal suffered a depression in the mid-1870s, and many of Olmsted's plans were abandoned. The carriageway was built, but it was done hastily and without regard to the original plan. None of the vegetation choices were followed and the reservoir was never built. Anyway, this is what remained of his uh, effort. And, uh, but you can still already kind of get a glimpse at, the, at, at his style, so to speak, you know, working indeed in a, in a so-called picturesque way, meaning in a free way, in, a, in an organic way and uh, welcoming accidents and you know, unexpected uh, um, curves. And uh, it, 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 it is the will of the gardener here, of the landscape architect, but it is a will which is, uh, which is not uh, at all, uh, uh, it's, it's neither timid nor, uh, nor uh, rationalistic. On the other hand, it's not aggressive towards what nature is and uh, should be con considered to be Okay, so this is Montreal in Canada. We are approaching the end of this short uh, presentation about him. The grounds of the US Capitol and White House. This is a different kind of landscape because of the, of the uh, formality that, uh, uh, you know, the political uh, aspects of, of, of these buildings uh, uh, meant for nearly 20 years. Olmsted oversaw the development of the Capitol grounds. In 1874, Congress commissioned Olmsted to plan and oversee landscape improvements. It was Olmsted who gave the Capitol grounds dignified formality to heighten the Capitol's architectural beauty. Olmsted's original design called for a ground plan that would unite the White House, the White House, Capitol, and other government agencies to symbolize the union of the nation. He scaled back his grand plans, however, being permitted to develop only 50 acres, 20 hectares, then comprising the capital grounds. Unable to create a park amid the capital surroundings, uh, he instead designed a picturesque scene that emphasized the capital's beauty in places where the entire building could be seen. Olmsted was paid only $1,500 for his original design of the grounds. Now, I don't know why this is mentioned. Anyway, he uh, also was allotted money for travel expenses, salaries for his hired hands, and the sizable uh, 200,000s budget for improvements to the Capitol grounds. During his 18 years as the landscape architect of the Capitol, Olmsted worked to create a scene where the architectural triumph of the Capitol would be emphasized. Um, I don't know very well about that architectural triumph of the capital. This is a, a, a conformist point of view. While the natural beauty of the grounds would offer comfort and solace to visitors and city goers, they would not supersede the capital's views and sight lines. Anyway, I personally like more, uh, you know, his form, less formal work, but I understand why this was done here in this way because he had to. It couldn't be too picturesque, although there are aspects of, of a picturesque landscape right here. But all in all, seen from above, there is symmetry, uh, there is formalism, formality, because yes, it's a different context, of course. So he was able to, he was flexible enough to understand that a certain context requires a certain kind of landscape design. The Washington Park in Chicago, a uh, smaller park, um, and uh, still Olmsted. I continue to think, and maybe I reiterate excessively, but we need nature. The more, the better. 
it's not just the beauty, but it's the production of oxygen, which we need so badly. He also designed the world's Colombian ex exposition. I mean, the, the grounds, the, the landscape was done by him uh, for, for the large world's exhibition from 1893 in Chicago. And by the way of this, he worked also with uh, with the architect I'm going to talk about tomorrow, H. H. Richardson. Apparently, they got along very well, and they 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 collaborated on, on several projects by H. Uh, H. Richardson, one of the three forefathers of modern architecture in the United States. Anyway, what exactly he did here? I mean, yes, we see green, we see water, we see the buildings. Uh, he did the design, but this the problem with exhibitions, uh, world exhibition, is that they don't last for long, and uh, such uh, you know, uh, all efforts somehow end in futility. And I I, I think it's 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 a reason to deplore this fact that you know most buildings are destroyed, if not all of them, and I imagine also the landscape was destroyed. Too bad. You know, because you know, talent when the work, uh, resources, and so on. But this is the the destiny of all uh, uh, world exhibitions. Here we see some buildings that seem to arrive in Chicago from Asia, South Asia, or I don't know. And we'll see uh, the last picture of the of the present. This short presentation on Olmsted will show him having in the background a scene that seems to be not the United States. Uh, you'll understand when I arrive there, maybe in the next picture after this one. Uh, anyway, here it is. You, you know, I mean, uh, the architecture doesn't really belong to Chicago and maybe not even this uh, boat, but here is the man looking at us and uh, imploring us silently to appreciate nature and to uh, uh, accommodate uh, more space for it in, in our works. Okay, so now I, I go to, um, so happy birthday, uh, Mr. Olmsted, I'll go to IMP, who was also born on the 26th of, uh, of uh, April. He was born in China, and uh, and then he his family moved to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, he studied there. He was um, there was a, his family was a well-to-do family. They they were uh, you know they they had the money, uh, but uh, his mother and he was very close to his mother. And you know there is a saying that usually great architects have a, have a special relationship to their mothers. She died when he was still, uh, I think, uh, 13 years old. She died of cancer and uh, he was very upset or, you know, she was, he was very affected by it. And at 17, I think he moved to the United States to study at the University of Pennsylvania. Then he was disappointed by the, by the School of Architecture there, which was uh, very bizarre. He moved to MIT. Uh, and then, um, although he was disappointed in there too, uh, he, he, he did his studies there. Then later on, he uh, um, arrived at Harvard, having, uh, working with uh, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and so on. He, and he, he was launched uh, by a set of circumstances into his career uh, in auspicious ways. He loved Le Corbusier. He said that two days, just two days spent kind of in the proximity of Le Corbusier who was visiting uh, the United States and MIT uh, was, was his most important training in architecture, which shows clearly that an inspiring figure like uh, Le Corbusier had a great effect on someone like I.M. Pei, and I'm sure not just on him. Um, very often this man smiling, you know, and uh, uh, it's almost irritating, you know, his continuous smile. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know, what is the reason for so much smiling, Mr. Pei? I know you had success, and uh, you did, and almost in an exasperating way. 
uh, by the way, I saw an interview with him where he was asked about Louis Kahn, and I think he understood, Pei, that um, despite the fact that it's difficult to, uh, to establish hierarchies, he, he understood that Kahn was a greater architect than he was. But still, Pei meant something, and uh, even after he associated himself with, uh, with uh, two other partners, uh, later in his life, he, he produced work which was uh, at least uh, decent, and I'm not very generous when I see when I say this. Um, he manipulated geometry very well, and uh, he was uh, uh, maybe in a way geometry was also a trap for him because it, it, it offered him a, a, an easy way out, so to speak, of you know, complex uh, or difficult situations. I have been here, I, I was under that uh, pyramid, glass pyramid, and I, I wasn't very impressed because I, I felt somehow underneath it that I, I could have been on, on, in an airport. Uh, and the idea of a glass pyramid also left me cold because just like the glass dome above the Reichstag by Sir Norman Foster, here, a glass pyramid is uh, somehow, um, I don't know if I am uh, totally objective in what I say. I, I am subjective and I don't deny it. And I think it's unavoidable to be subjective. But in my opinion, uh, a pyramid should, should not be made of glass. Although I myself in a very early project, I, I imagined uh, a glass pyramid and uh, actually I drew it uh, some 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 years before he built this in Paris, uh, but mine remained on paper. His is not on paper. It's right there for all to see. It's it's a good work, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if if there is so much reason for for this triumphalist uh, eternal smile on his face. Anyway, maybe he's just a lucky fellow. You know. Uh, Although I like him more here as a young man, where, where he doesn't smile so uh, ostentatiously, uh, and uh, he does look like a, like a clever young man uh, who knew how to handle the requirements of MIT and then uh, later on the, those of Harvard and so on. Please don't stop, don't smile like this all the time, Mr. Pei, please. First project. 131 Ponce de Leon, Ponce de Leon Avenue in Atlanta, 1949. Uh, <laughs> you would say, wait a minute, you know, why are you showing us this? You know, there is nothing glorious here. It's true, there is nothing glorious here. But the early works of architects often are like this, you know, they didn't start, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't start with the Guggenheim. I am paid, didn't start with his later buildings which are more dramatic and sculptural. So it's an early work and we should forgive him for this. Now this here, we are, we are already in the field of an architecture which uh, uh, makes us uh, consider with uh, seriousness. It's already uh, dramatic. I mean, look at this and look at this. It's a change, isn't it? Here he shows his skill. Uh, it's 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 a sculptural architecture. It's it's even more dramatic than the than the mountain behind. Uh, I will come back to some of these buildings, not the, the first one later on in in detail. Dormitories and new college in Florida also an early work, and I will say also an excellent work. Even in this picture, what I look at it's. It's yes, it's rectangular, uh, but it's orthogonal. But I, 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 it has a certain geometrical viscerality, which uh, I think is to be appreciated. And it even has something, if I would say so, Chinese about it. Uh, if there is something like this, I just read a, 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 an interview with Wang Shu, who said that. In China now, you know, people talk about uh, this is very Chinese, but he said that we don't have any longer a true identity. The Chinese cities of the present borrow from many other cultures and times. And so it's, it's that so-called uh, uh, this is very Chinese is not there any longer. 
and he complained about it. But, but IMP was a robust architect who understood and was attracted by a certain kind of modernity without too much sophistication, but this was its quality. It was, <clears throat> it was an architecture that was, uh, um, you know, uh, easy to, 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 to understand. And, uh, and uh, he was very successful. The jo John F. Kennedy Library, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a major work by him. I mean, just the name itself, you know, to design the library, the, the Kennedy Library is not a little thing. So this man who was born in China actually uh, became uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, a flagship in a way. I mean, his architecture is a flagship architecture for North American uh, even uh, very, you know, uh, politically charged uh, buildings, like this one, for example. This is very nice about North America that, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, if you, if you, if you resonate with the, with the culture and with the land, it welcomes you, and 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 this is the the proof right here. A man who was already kind of grown up. He left China in when he was seventeen, and uh, and and yet he arrived at building, you know, buildings like this one, the, the Kennedy Library. I'm curious how the, the Trump library will be like. It will probably be covered in gold and will have columns and so on. Uh, but, you know, these libraries uh, have a symbolic uh, meaning which, uh, uh, which, which is important. And uh, I'm glad that Pei built this one in this way, you know, modernistic, uh, I mean, there, there are no ambiguities here. This is a, a building which proclaims uh, modernity in a monumental way. You might like it or you might not like it, but, but that's what it is. You, you get what you see. Providence Cathedral Square modeled after the Greek Agora marketplace. This is a different kind of work. He, in a way, he did landscape here. And uh, I think it's a good work and the unexpected when you think of, of the, just of the buildings that we saw until now, but we'll continue to see others. Um, penthouse in from 1976 is this one here, you know, kind of uh, ostentatious. Dallas City Hall, uh, again, a modernity without any kind of ambiguity. Uh, please be kind and if you are so kind, turn off the microphone, thank you. Or unless you want to say something, uh, thank you. Uh, it, th this was about a North America which believed in itself, which, uh, uh, which believed in modernity and uh, this is why IMP was the right man at the right time. The John Hancock Tower in Boston, a fine uh, skyscraper. The Everson Museum. Um, he worked well with glass, but he also worked well with, uh, with uh, opacity, with plain walls, as you can see here. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, he worked well with, uh, with uh, triangles as well. Uh, the pyramidal form uh, is, is shown here as well, not just in Paris. 
uh, he loved to manipulate uh, geometry in uh, not complicated ways, but still rotating them and diagonals and triangles. It's, I wouldn't say it's a very complex architecture. It's rather simple, simplest, but, but he's able still to surprise here and there. And um, I think he was a good architect. He received the Pritzker Prize. Let us not uh, forget to mention it, just as uh, Peter Zumthor did. So we have today uh, two architects who received the so-called Nobel Prize in Architecture. I think he received it in 1985 or 1983, uh, I From what I understood, he decided to come to study in the United States. He, he, he had to decide between the United States and England, and the, he decided to come to University of Pennsylvania because he said he was, uh, uh, um, he knew that in the United States, this was his impression. He saw some Hollywood movies and he, he had a feeling that in the States, uh, the college life, college life was all fun and uh, he was attracted by that, and that's why he came to the States, only to learn that it wasn't quite like that. And it was also hard work uh, at uh, the American University. It wasn't just uh, fun, Hollywood fun. Uh, anyway, um, this, by the way, that he was commissioned to design the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Society Hill Towers in Philadelphia, he did some fine uh, um, housing complexes like this one. He also did in New York City. And um, I like these towers. They are monolithic, they are, they are simple, but uh, they have a certain sensitivity because of the fenestration. You know, the, also it is regular, yes, but uh, the rhythm and the, the is, it shows some, some, some sensitivity in my opinion. Here is a typical plan of an apartment. The truth is you can have a, you know, a regular architecture like this one, which is uh, legitimate and maybe even impressive. Oh, the, the apartments, the, the interior, what can we say? You know, they are as they are. The furniture is as it is. The fruits they're waiting to be uh, consumed are uh, probably uh, delicious. But uh, anyway. Silver Towers in New York. You recognize the, you know, the, the author. By now, here is a, a sculptural piece by Picasso. Uh, and uh, Gateway East, Singapore. Well, he began then, you know, the commercial side of his architecture began to be amplified and the more commissions he got, but what can we say? You know, he still played, you know, geometry saved him in a way from banality. I don't consider him one of the greatest architects. And I think he himself didn't consider himself in such a way, but he was a good architect. And uh, you'll see uh, towards the end uh, work he did in China, which is, uh, which was, I think, uh, 
a good attempt to try to connect with the, with the, with the culture of the country he left, but where he was born. The Four Seasons Hotel, well, he was already with the two partners, Cobb and Free, um, and he designed this at his firm. Sometimes both Cobb and Free would do works by themselves in a way, in, in total charge of the project. Although Pei was the originator of the office. Now here is a touch of uh, postmodernism. Maybe the touch is uh, more than just a touch, but uh, still the vigor of his modernity is to be shown. Oh, yes, such things uh, probably he wouldn't be very proud of now if he was alive. At that time, also Philip Johnson built the uh, AT&T building and L'Enfant Plaza Hotel. This is an earlier work. Um, I don't know. I mean, yes, a certain monumentality. Uh, maybe not too much grace, uh, pyramid, a small glass pyramid that he likes. So what he did in Paris is not a singular work. This is in a small, a smaller version of what he did in Paris. The pyramid in Paris, we already saw, but now we are going to see some more pictures and more of his uh, eternal smile. Um, I imagine that he was, uh, a pleaser when he smiles so much, which is not really, uh, I think, a great thing to be called uh, that you are a pleaser, but uh, it was a mask. That's what I'm trying to say, all that continuous smiling. You know, I mean, what is so much reason for so much smiling? Of course, I'm envious. I wish I had reasons to smile like him all the time. Uh, I still think in this work, if I am to grade it, if I'm allowed to think of something like this, I would give it an eight, uh, no more than eight. Uh, but, but it's still, uh, I mean, here, you know, this easily could have been an airport or a mall. Uh, this is an artwork that an artist did playing with, uh, with uh, his work. Um, and um, it, it begins to be a little more interesting. Um, Anyway, a pyramid, in my opinion, represents authority and the quest for eternity. At least this is what the pyramids in Egypt tell us. And uh, here being made of glass, uh, you are, uh, there seems to be something of a contradiction somehow, you know, but there is this centrality which didn't need to be accentuated. We already have the Louvre, which represents the power of the kings. Do we need an, uh, you know, an underlining of that, uh, really? I, I am not so sure. But this I like because there is the duality and the big pyramid is turned upside down. So there is some kind of a reversal here and something subversive. As such, I think is, uh, is uh, much more acceptable. But its rhetorics are, I, for me, they, are, they, are, they continue to be uh, a little bit questionable. Not here though, I, and I, I said why, because I see something subversive here is the other side where I just watch a, uh, uh, the evaluation of some projects at SciArc and the student, uh, um, a graduating student, he showed a project uh, for um, uh, the new European Parliament where he fragmented, decapitated in a way, fragmented uh, the existing building and then reassembled the parts in a different way. So it was that su subversive strategy to connect on one hand with the past and on the other hand to subvert it and to, to sabotage it. And here you could say the same thing. We have the authority of the Louvre and then we have, we have this upside down pyramid, which in a way tries to restore some equilibrium and some justice in a way. It's too bad that 
you know, the subversion was actually uh, uh, secondary to, to the celebration, the glorification of centrality uh, that, that we see in, uh, not so much in this picture because of the uh, subversion of the artists who did the work around it. But uh, now, Mr. Pei, please, please don't point towards it in such a uh, childish way, you know, because it's not so great, your pyramid, really. But there was a man full of himself, really. Although in the interview I, sh I, I saw with him being asked about Khan, he, he, he was aware, he was a lucid man. He knew that, that he was not, he didn't have the artistic uh, uh, intensity and, and greatness of Khan. But still, he is, he was. He will be, I am Pei, Bank of China. Good work in a way, but still celebrating the big corporations, uh, you know, capitalism. And uh, fortunately, he has these geometries, which in the, you know, uh, unexpectedness sometimes evoke uh, that bulwark of resistance that Tadawando at one moment asked for. That architects should also uh, express, you, uh, at least sometimes, some opposition to what they think is uh, problematic. And these diagonals, maybe, maybe, although you see here, is perfectly symmetrical. And uh, yes, there is this X here, and yes, there are some distortions and rotations. But all in all, this building doesn't hide the, 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 the overwhelming power of high capitalism. In fact, it celebrates it. But seen from certain parts, you know, especially if you, if you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, make abstraction of or not see this, uh, you know, uh, part of the building, but the more asymmetrical sides is okay, I think. Now, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of structure that is moved to the periphery apparently was, uh, was uh, originating with the John Hancock Tower in, uh, in, uh, in Chicago. And it's an, an interesting idea to have this, uh, this um, uh, you know, th that's why these diagonals, which are on one hand structural and on the other hand, they are ornamental. And uh, as opposed to the tower on the left and the tower on the right, which rely on the power of the of the grid. Here, the the moving of the structure towards the periphery uh, is uh, is uh, beneficial also aesthetically, and the building stands out because of it, just as it happens with John Hancock Tower in Chicago. This museum I like. It's it's uh, it's um, you know his return to Asia. I think uh, uh, brought out some maybe un, unexpressed an unexpressed side in his work, um, especially what he did. In, you're going to see a work he did in China. Uh, it's. It's still IMP, it's still in part a little bit corrupted by uh, what I call, uh, there is something a little bit commercial in his work. But uh, what can you do at this level of accomplishment as he had? Um, he, I guess he had to be, uh, it, it's very, very difficult to, to, to be very pure and very, you know, kind of, uh, you know, have a critical side to your work and at the same time to achieve, you know, the success, the so-called success that he had. He's very good at this, this, these manipulations with geometry, with triangles, with pyramids. Uh, and it, this is shown here as well. Although a certain level of demagogy exists and uh, when we think about glass being uh, problematic when it comes to losses of energy, 
then uh, that feeling of uneasiness increases. A memorial chapel, uh, when you think of a chapel, you generally think is something smaller than what we look at here, but uh, it's more like a cathedral than a chapel. I would, I would describe it, I feel tempted to describe it in some kind of a um, maybe provocative way to, to call it a misanthropic uh, chapel. A chapel should not be misanthropic and from this side is not, but from this side is. It's so, um, you know, so opaque. Anyway, it's more engineering really. And because of the engineering, uh, the building is, uh, you know, acceptably interesting, if I can call it so. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, which is a well-known building by him, um, he got these big commissions, you know. Uh, look at him. He plays with these triangles in, uh, in uh, moderately interesting ways, but he's able to make, uh, to make this work. And... Uh, Seen from here, I think his building is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is fine. And, and, and somehow the dialogue between, uh, you know, the, the political uh, power, power and uh, the, the architectonic power is, uh, is one where the, the architectonic power is not, uh, is not losing. Is, um, I think this building is more interesting and more engaging than what we see here. And not just because it is modern. And even the plans of the building, I think they are, they are uh, engaging uh, graphically, you know, but it's not just about graphics. It's, 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 it's a building that, is, uh, that stands, stands uh, at all levels, graphically, uh, structurally, aesthetically. It's interesting. And I see here, you know, this play with the two triangles or two pyramids, in this case, in the plan, one triangle pointing upwards, the other triangle pointing downwards. So it's some kind of a yin-yang uh, uh, dialectics here that is uh, maybe was in him coming from China, but I, I find it very, very uh, valuable. This saved him from banality. Uh, and uh, look, look, look at the building here. It's, 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 it's fine exactly because it has this built-in duality. I think this is one of his best works. To, towards the outside, maybe it is a little bit predictable, but he's saved by... Uh, also, the artworks around, uh, I don't know if this is an Henri Moore sculpture. And, uh, you know, again, the small uh, pyramids of glass here and there, scattered, uh, uh, mobile by Alexander Calder here. And, you know, with, with such art around the building and inside the building, uh, uh, you can uh, do a building that is not brilliant necessarily, but the bit the, but everything works because art is bringing in that emotion and that dynamism which which uh, uh, which makes the breathing air breathable berlin deutsche historisches museum uh, uh, an interesting effort and i i, I like this there too bad is covered by this emphatic uh, glass uh, which of course needs provokes the need for for um, for a lot of air conditioning. Otherwise, you although you kind of can run quickly away from it, but still, is a lot of glass here, and I I I I, uh, I imagine that no one would claim that this is a sustainable building.
But we see here again, IMP uh, understanding that if one builds in the proximity of an uh, older building, it doesn't mean one has to be, uh, you know, uh, unengaging. No, is uh, he the same modern modernist architect who uh, builds, uh, you know, with conviction in this way? And I think he needs to be applauded for this. If I have any reticence, is based on the fact that indeed he is using these very large surfaces of glass, uh, and then he opposes them with these very very large surfaces of, of of blank walls. But somehow there is no mediating element between the two. So this is in Berlin. Now this museum in China is is is, uh, is interesting, I think, because it, it must have been for him a, an emotional uh, return to, to to China, and he remained IMP, the North American architect, by now. But but he had to handle uh, a culture that uh, was in his veins, and uh, and uh, I think to an extent he did. I still see the same problem that, that he is unable or unwilling, but this is also part of his force to bring uh, that intermediate element in between, uh, between the big and the small. Uh, th there are no uh, negotiating uh, uh, hands, so to speak, between the two. So you have these very blank walls, in my opinion, a little bit too blank and too white. What saves him is again the manipulation of geometry, where he is able to visceralize geometry through these rotations, and he's good at it. He was good at this, and even from the outside, for example, here, it's an interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, form of aesthetics. You have geometry, but somehow you have the feeling that this we are not any longer in North America. Now, of course, we know we are in China. But I think there was something there that uh, that uh, provoked a certain change in his way of, of, of externalizing uh, the functions of the building and expressing what he had to express through this museum. Um, With a, just a little bit more grace, perhaps he could have, I don't know, I st it still troubles me, this portion of the building is, 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 is too blank. Although he tried to, you know, uh, connect it, it to, to the tradition, so to speak, of the place, but uh, it's not very convincing here, I think. Anyway, um, I, I think it's a good work. It's a good work, and it is. It tried to. It's more fragmented than other works by him, which is a good thing, and it relates to what is around the, the building in a way. But he couldn't escape, and he probably didn't even intend to a certain uh, triumphalism. Even here, this, this, this entrance into the museum is, is uh, an immodest one. Usually an entrance into, especially into an institutional building, needs to have some, you know, uh, uh, a certain power, so to speak. But it depends how far that power goes. Here I, I would say that these are just a touch of, of triumphalism, which for me is a little bit problematic. He also designed this museum of Islamic art in Doha, in Qatar. Uh, and uh, here is, is the same architect trying to mimic a little bit, uh, you know, uh, some connection with the local culture. Uh, but I, I don't think, I mean, yes, the windows, you know, as opposed to the windows in the previous building, there we were in China, now we, we are in Qatar, 
and you know th these are kind of facile uh, attempts to honor the the culture of the place a little bit in my opinion just a little bit too facile he never he was never truly able to escape maybe in very few early works but in general he was not able to 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 avoid a certain level of uh, what i call commercialism and that is i think uh, I, and it's possible he was aware of it uh, that's why he said that uh, you know khan khan was a better architect and i think he was He, he was too much, too accommodating. I am Bay was too accommodating. That's why, just like his smile was too was too uh, too pleasing. It was his architecture is sometimes, but not always, and not to a grave extent actually. But it is a little bit the architecture of someone who accommodates uh, uh, accommodates a lot, and uh, could be could be to an extent at least be accused of being a pleaser. I mean, look even at these helicoidal stairs, you know, they, that they are so predictable and so emphatic at the same time that uh, they, they, they turn me off. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that might be my particular uh, disposition of the mind, or I don't know how to call it. He was certainly a, a man who knew how to uh, accommodate and even please authority. When he was not uh, attempting to be a pleaser in an ideological sense, I think he was at his best. And now we arrive at uh, an, 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 a different kind of architect. Uh, so happy birthday, I am pay. And now we go to Peter Zumthor. Uh, an architect who uh, uh, is very different from I am Pei. And uh, sorry about this. I have a, I have his presentation on a, uh, on one by Studio Fuchsas and uh, and him. So I'll just show you today, uh, Peter Zumthor or Peter Zumthor. Okay, a Swiss architect. Everybody knows. But he was not really, and he's not really an architect. He was uh, rather a furniture designer who turned to architecture. And uh, it seems in Switzerland, uh, it's possible to, to become an architect, uh, although he, he didn't have training as an architect. Uh, and yes, he got the Pritzker Prize as well. He, is, he was born, I think, in 1944 or 1943, uh, and uh, here is the man. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I, I have a, I, maybe something, you know, they say, the mystics say that uh, we do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. So it's possible that he irritates me a little bit because there is something in me that, 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 that I see in him or I project in him and I'm not happy with that. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit irritated by this man, but I'm trying to, to, to be as, as, as sympathetic as possible or uh, to have a certain empathy. I, I don't know. I mean, he has qualities, no doubt, but uh, maybe also it irritates me a little bit the fact that in certain circles he is uh, uh, seen like an idol, but I, I really don't see that mystic that he he tries to depict himself uh, as being. And uh, you know, you just look at this face. This is not the face of a mystic. I'm really, uh, very sorry. This is. I, I actually think this is the face of a cunning man. Is uh, <laughs> he he knows what he's doing, and. Uh, I'm not sure at all he's a displeaser, although that museum he designed for Los Angeles, I feel that unconsciously or consciously he, he, he was critical there towards uh, the city of Los Angeles and who knows, maybe beyond the city itself. Anyway, of course he smokes a cigar because most uh, 
or or other you know uh, architects with a with a with a liking for uh, for uh, power uh, smoke cigars. Even the the present day uh, director of Sayark, he also smokes cigars. And uh, there are others, and I wonder what uh, Sigmund Freud would say about this. Why do architects uh, even miss when smoking cigars? It's something about about the architect who smokes a cigar. I'm sure there are already writings about this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Yetzumtor, but I don't believe you are mystic. I look again at you and I don't believe you are mystic and I don't trust you as a mystic. You might have other qualities, but you don't convince me. I mean, look, didn't I say it? He always depicts himself in this way, you know, the solitary man who works in a village with only 100 inhabitants all by himself. But I'm absolutely sure he has an office and he has people helping him. Where are those people? They are not shown. Uh, I'll go in detail through the, his most important buildings. Now I just show some images of, of, of various works by him, like a, an informal introduction to his works. I still think he was, he is, and was, and will be probably a rationalist, and not just because he uses right angles. You can use right angles and not be a rationalist, and you can even I, I say now something maybe uh, foolish. You can use round uh, lines or forms and still be a rationalist. It's not so much about the form itself. It's about the, the, the state of mind that appears to me to be behind the work. Uh, this museum uh, in, uh, in uh, Norway, I think it is. I mean, you, you, you know where Norway is. You know that there is no there. You know that, the, you know, this is this is a, a climate where, where, you know, there are rains and snows. You cannot do such a floor, such a roof there. It's impossible. I mean, this man ignores some very basic... I, I'm, not, I'm not a functionalist and I, I don't have great, uh, you know, uh, knowledge in our respect for, uh, uh, for functionalism, but, but certain things I do know that in the North, I include here even Switzerland. Switzerland has uh, heavy snows. He ignores completely this. And I, I'll show you some other buildings by him where he ignores the fact that, you know, you need to do something about the snow. Here you have, now maybe this is not so important because it's kind of a pavilion and exterior structure is, but you'll see it done in, in, in other instances. Like here again, you know, it's, I think he's superficial. He's graphically maybe trying to convey a certain uh, kind of aesthetics, but which are in contradiction with the place where the building is built. And I will show you other things which to me are disturbing. I'm talking about here where the structure of his building touches the stone and what he does to the stones to me is unbelievable. Uh, uh, and it's not, it, it is unbelievable for any architect, not just one who received the Pritzker Prize. Um, I'll arrive at a picture with uh, what I'm trying to say. I really, do, I, I really don't understand why, why the, such a building or structure is uh, considered so highly by the students in architecture. I mean, what is so remarkable, actually, you know? Maybe what is uh, good here is that he has these scattered structures, but to me, they are rather ominous, black and with these flat, almost flat roofs. Uh, and uh, I, I, I see something uh, ominous here. You know, I almost feel like, I don't know, are they, are they truly connecting with nature here or are they there is something of uh, like small cells, black cells. I, I, I almost like a, a, I don't know why I, I keep thinking of a possible. Uh, uh, I don't know. They have something of a concentration camp. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw here a soldier with a rifle, and you know, and it, it's kind of an architecture that uh, 
uh, I find it ominous. Also, what is interesting, I mean, interesting in a negative way, and you, you'll see some examples from the inside, the window is placed very low and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's as if you are only meant to look downwards and not upwards. Uh, I mean, it's at a low level. I hope I have a picture here. Uh, I know I have from another building, but maybe from here too. Anyway. Um, If creativity is exuberance, I don't really see here a lot of exuberance, unless we are talking about a, an exuberance with a negative sign in front of it. But wouldn't that mean some kind of an anti-creativity? Now, this to me is very provocative. To pierce stone in this way, uh, uh, to me, it doesn't show a, a lot of uh, gracefulness and a lot of uh, empathy or sympathy or even love for nature. In my opinion, he, he raped the stones here in this way. This is not about the art of joining. If Kenneth Frampton talked about the adoration of the joint in the case of Carlos Scarpa, we cannot use the same words here. This is not joining. So I understand that he wanted to place the building here, but, but this kind of, of, uh, of attaching the structure to the stone to me is brutal. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, sorry for the words, he's raping the stone, he's raping the rock. Look at this. You know, this, this is, in my opinion, this is not what a mystic does and not a lover of art and of uh, nature. Uh, someone who loves nature has a certain respect even for this so-called inert rock. He doesn't. It shows clearly here. He pierces. He crucifies the rock. You know, it's, it's to me, it's disturbing. I would say he does the same here. If you think about the Japanese, you know, in their old art, uh, in, in, in a building with stone where they didn't even use nails. But look at here. I mean, this is a man who, who earlier designed furniture. He should know better. This is aggressivity towards wood as well. Now, I understand you have to connect these parts in a certain way. But if you are a skillful architect, you try to avoid such aggressive gestures. There, are, there is aggressivity here and there is aggressivity here. That's what I see. How to do it otherwise, I don't know. Here is the skill of the architect where it's to be shown. But I don't see this here. I, I see a certain efficientism, yes, but uh, not a very gentle one, not a very graceful one. That's what I see. And his architecture, in my opinion, is also not a very graceful one. Even, even in terms of colors. Why paint this in black? Could you tell me? Why? Why black? It could have been yellow one, one red, one green, one blue. Why all black? And what alarms me is that the, the immense influence this man has on, 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 on young architects and on older architects and on students of architecture. And in my opinion, this is not an architecture that uh, encourages one to move towards uh, equation that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, imagined, creativity equals exuberance. Really, I would expect here, as I said, to see a soldier with a rifle at the entrance of some uh, camp, concentration camp or prison camp, or uh, it's like, a, how is it called? The Tower of, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a, somehow a cynical architecture for me. In this context, in, I mean, look at it, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful context now. And uh, this nature uh, doesn't make you humble in the good sense of the word. That's what I said, you know, with the windows being at a low level, at the level of the knees. If you sit on the, on the chair, 
your knees are about on the level of the bottom of the of the windows. Do you see the sky from here now? You only look downwards as if the sky doesn't matter. But the majesty of the of the mountains does not matter. I think it should matter. So it's kind of strange that the windows are at such a low level when in fact they could have been higher easily. I find the interior also a little bit oppressive. <laughs> now, you know, I found this picture, you know, and what do I see here? It, do I see Zeus? No, it's not Zeus, it's the architect, but the way, the way he, 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 you know, uses his hands to you know, uh, attract attention to probably a model is so rhetorically charged that uh, that kind of introversion that uh, true mystic has does not appear to me here at all. Uh, it's, I mean, look at it, you know, as if it's some kind of uh, uh, the, the golden egg humanity always search for, you know. I'm sorry, Mr. Zumtor, but this is not this is not the beginning and it's not the end of the world and it's not the the treasure of the world it's a little structure where you rape the stones the rocks and uh, with a flat roof totally inappropriate for this uh, uh, landscape and uh, what's what's the meaning of this unbelievable uh, you know uh, demagogy of the hands i don't understand it but maybe i'm blind to something uh I see other gestures of lack of empathy towards this poor wood here, you know, uh, left uh, unprotected in a rather harsh climate, I would say, and with some gestures of, uh, you know, an old traditional technique where you can uh, burn the wood. And uh, I don't know exactly what he wanted to say with this, but uh, I'll show other examples. And, and you see here this, this, this harsh realities of, of uh, connect, connecting in an aggressive way pieces of wood. Again, this is not the art of joinery. No, it has nothing to do with it. It's imagine a couple you now where the two partners are joined in this way. Would you call that a couple? No. No. Anyway. We are, it's true, we are, not in, we are not living in gentle times. Who do that kind of sophisticated and complex, highly refined joinery that is, is to be found in old Japanese buildings? No one probably today. But from a furniture maker, I would expect a little more attentiveness and care and, and gentleness towards that wood that is, you should have affection towards. Now this building in Köln, uh, also, it, to me, is a little bit problematic because there is a certain, uh, I would call a, a lack of sensitivity towards the way he handles the remnants of the past, which are seen here at the bottom. Uh, the building is gray. Uh, you know, before we saw blackness, now we see grayness. And look at this, you know, this these were former windows, probably with uh, stained glass windows. But when I look at this, I, 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 I cannot be too happy, you know, or exuberant. It's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a stern reminder of the, of the, of the uh, fatalities of history. Uh, it's, I understand I'm not against a critical architecture. But I don't know if this was the place to, I mean, this is the place to do this. This is a museum you now, and uh, I don't know, it's something here that I don't like. And what is above, it's nice inside somehow because it, 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 it pierces the wall and you see this constellation of little lights. Uh, we are going to look at it, but otherwise the building is, is still a, a boxy architecture. 
you know, it's rectangular and it's rather harsh, despite these, uh, you know, fragments of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, quasi uh, sensitivity. I don't think this is one of his best buildings. He has some some buildings which are uh, a little better, but I like the stair though. The stair is nice. I think this 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 uh, here he shows uh, uh, sensitivity. Uh, yes, it's still a rational language, but I think uh, it's 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 it, this one is convincing. This one uh, I, I totally accept. But the other parts of the building, including the interior, and we are going to arrive, uh, I, they, they leave me cold. Maybe that's what he intended, to leave one cold. It's possible. Although I like the fact that he takes risks. You look at the zigzagging, uh, you know, uh, walkway within the, within, the, within the building. I like the fact that he he's, is able and was able to do this as well. And we are going to see pictures of that. On the other hand, this uh, uh, um, embroidery in reverse somehow, I don't know if I call it correctly, you know, he, 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 he tries to create a porous architecture. There is porosity here, but it's a porosity which is still... Uh, somehow unconvincing because in my opinion it's not very it's not really a very subtle or graceful or kind um, uh, porosity it is at the cerebral level but at the, at the um, instinctual level if i can say so I, I, I for me it is not maybe for someone else it is Why this might be considered a great building, personally, I do not know. The only thing that I, I, I totally agree with is that staircase that I showed. But the building otherwise, I don't find it impressive. What I see in his work is almost a, a man without too many illusions. And when I reflect on what he said, that he lost a long time ago the belief that architecture should save the world, uh, maybe he was honest then. And I see, yes, a kind of a maybe disillusioned man, a man without too many illusions. He continues to build, but he doesn't seem to have that, that maybe childish or naive uh, uh, faith in the, in the power of architecture to change the world. Although, in my opinion, someone who continues to build um, should have, to an extent, this belief. Otherwise, why would you build? So there is some kind of ambiguity here. You know, he is aware of the, of the misgivings of life, of history, and they are shown even here. You know, it's you know, uh, he keeps this fragment of the old building, but it's, it's not it's not really joined to the new building by him in a loving way. It's, it's like, uh, okay, we have a remnant of the old building and we incorporate it in the new, but there is no negotiation again between the, uh, the other, just as there is no negotiation in the buildings I showed before between the wooden structure and the rock. Uh, it's 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 kind of a insensitive way to uh, to incorporate the old into the new. It's very factual. It's true, but it's not not more than factual. I don't see here sympathy or empathy or love. Uh, this uh, chapel, uh, Brother Klaus Field Chapel, which is uh, very admired, 
by many people and the interior is nice indeed but um, uh, this one this I, this one I, I like very much uh, uh, and uh, here I think is one of the, the best architectural sequences he uh, he generated but I have a problem with the outside why would this interior be hidden within a building that here we see the interior suggested in this drawing in a in a poetical way in a lyrical way but look at the in my opinion the brutality of this triangle this doorway which which uh, and is is not just the doorway is the whole building let me see if i have i should have sorry i should have a, i don't have another picture here but you know it, it's, 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 it's literally a, a prismatic, uh, opaque building. And this, this door to me tells, tells me a lot about him. What is a door? A door is your first contact with a building, the entrance door into a building. And this, besides the fact that it is triangular, so in that sense is unusual, it's a blank metallic door which I think is very harsh and uh, um, is not welcoming. Is in my opinion, for me, is not welcoming. I like very much the interior, as I said. Uh, this, I do. I find it mysterious. I find it engaging artistically. The texture is, uh, is uh, convincing. The light is convincing. Everything is fine at the interior. But the exterior, especially here, the entrance is, uh, I think, is schematic and is, is harsh. This is my perception. I, it's true. I am subjective and I'm not saying I am not. But uh, it's a harsh entrance and it's metal. It's, it's, it's cold. It's, it's, and its geometry is cold too, this, this, this triangular, you know, tall uh, triangle with, uh, it, it is, in my opinion, is not. I mean, if you think of the uh, entrance door at Ronchon by Le Corbusier, where you have colors and shapes, it's, it's the very opposite of what we see here. This is, uh, is almost like you are entering into a prison. Again, it's, uh, it's uninviting, in my opinion. It's very blank, isn't it? Anyway, St. Benedict Chapel, uh, this one, uh, wait a minute, this I'm a little bit confused because I don't think, it, yes, there are two. I found one which is very similar to this one, but it's not by him. Uh, look at this one. Again, and in fact, you can already see uh, I be, I'm becoming a functionalist now. Mr. Uh, Tsumtor is forcing me to become what I'm actually not, a functionalist. But you see here some, uh, some uh, traces of the accumulation of snow on this roof, which does not allow the snow to, you know, uh, naturally fall to the ground, but remain stuck there. Well, obviously this man ignores the realities of, of his own country, meaning Switzerland where because there are heavy snows, you are supposed to have this kind of, of, of roof and not this kind. You know, uh, uh, even the, the, the most elementary ABC of architecture tells you that you cannot build in the mountains with such a roof. He does, he ignores it. Uh, he also has it flat here. So, <laughs> you know, the snow is punishing him. And I have other pictures, I hope here, where I show the effects of, uh, look, now you would say it's okay, you know, why shouldn't we, in fact, it's interesting, right? Uh, I remember that uh, uh, Le Corbusier, when he received a visit of some tourists from uh, Switzerland, in fact, and after they looked at his, some of his buildings, they asked him, well, sir, yes, they are very interesting, uh, your buildings, but uh, the, 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 they have many imperfections. And Le Corbusier answered to them, did you ever look in the mirror? Didn't you see how many, you know, pimples and all kinds of things you have on your face? There is no perfection. 
So in that sense, uh, what Snow did to this wall of his celebrated chapel is to be welcomed. But it's not just this. Look even at the stairs, how uneventful, how banal they are, really. They are very banal. So what is the greatness of this chapel? Because I don't understand it. Really, I don't. And there is a, there was a building built before this one that is very similar also. And I hope I have pictures with it here. But this ignoring of the, of the most elemental uh, needs of the place, that is, you know, the mountains of Switzerland, snow, uh, shows to me that this man doesn't care about, you know, the elements or the sky or you no, know, he just places this kind of poor uh, roofing, which is also architecturally very poor. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm really surprised, you know, to whom are, is the, the Prisker Prize given, you know, what is great about this, because I don't understand just the shape and plan of, the, of this chapel, I, I don't think it's so remarkable. Um, anyway, um, even the drawings, in my opinion, they are not great, but this is not, this were not done by him, actually, and now I turn against myself. Uh, I have seen very, very nice drawings by him uh, and watercolors done for Serpentine Gallery, and I hope I, I have pictures with them here. But uh, I hope this is this was not this this were not done by him because these these drawings are rather childish. On the other hand, this drawing is nice. You know, it's it's if he did it, I don't know. I don't know, maybe he did it. If he did it, I, I applaud it. It's a nice, it's a nice drawing. Um, the plan, what can we say? It's a vesica in a way, you know, and we can speculate about it. It's okay, but uh, still the fragility of the structure, you know, it's, um, although I'm not at all against fra fragile architecture, I admire fragile architecture, but, but it's not just about the form. It's also about the, 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 the mentality that generated it. And I don't have the feeling that this is a very modest man. Uh, but I, maybe, maybe I see my own immodesty projected into him. It's possible. Um, I just don't find it an enlightened and enlightening building. It's, it's more like the model of a building, a full scale model of a building. It's not yet a building. Now look at this one from 1959, meaning was built, I don't know, 30 years before Peter Zumthor's building. Look at this. It's kind of similar, but this is a building. And look at this. This was not done by Peter Zumthor. It was done by someone in 1959 kind of a similar in terms of the of the plan but in my opinion this building is more of a building meaning, meaning more of an architecture than one, what uh, Peter Zumthor did meaning this one anyway the memorial uh, we saw already uh, I think this is in Norway uh, and uh, it, it, to me, still, this is like, a, the, like the ghost of a building and not really a building. Uh, again, I'm not against fragility uh, at all or vulnerability, but here is some kind of a pretentious vulnerability because it's under the sign of reason. It's, it's like reason in itself is not, a, is not fragile. Or, or if it wants to express its fragility, it has to find a different way. Not with this, you know, very extensive, very, you know, one dimension. I mean, look at it, this is huge. This is not a sign of fragility, just because of the length is a very long dimension. The, material, the materiality of the building is, it denotes fragility, yes. But the, the, but the geometry and the length of the building, if we are to call it a building, I would hesitate to, to truly call it a building. Show something else. Don't show fragility, in my opinion. Look at this long corridor. In my opinion, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, a little bit threatening and uh, a little bit sadistic. And I would say his architecture has sadistic elements. Uh, he would be probably surprised to hear something like this. 
But I saw it in that work in Norway with those black uh, structures scattered between those majestic mountains. I saw it even in the chapel that I just saw with ignoring the realities of uh, the falling snow. And uh, all these long dimensions show me a willfulness which has, uh, in my opinion, some sadistic overtones. Maybe no one called him until now a sadistic architect, uh, but uh, I feel tempted to, to, uh, to do so. Even here, I don't really see love for the earth. You know, the way it is, uh, the structure is uh, penetrating the earth through these uh, metallic intermediates, it's... If I was a psychoanalyst, I would, uh, I would spend some time uh, with Mr. Tsumtor on the couch and try to find out something about him and maybe his mother. Maybe about his father as well, I don't know. Anyway, um, I guess what I'm trying to arrive at, and I'm, I might be wrong, but I guess what I'm trying to arrive at is that I think this gentleman doesn't love the world and maybe he doesn't love himself. Uh, um, anyway, I know I, I'm, 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 I'm now on a very shaky ground. A house. Now, in this house, again, my, my blood is boiling and I can tell you why. On the right, we see his intervention. On the left, we see the wisdom of the old existing building, which didn't have an architect. And it really revolts me that we don't have the wisdom of the, of the builders of the house, which didn't have an architect. So here we have Peter Zumtor, and here we have the the, the anonymous builder, I imagine, anonymous builder of the old building. He builds again in, in a totally astonishing way, shelves for the snow. I never saw something like this before. These are deep. They are at least 10, 15 centimeters wide. This is not a library inside one's room. These are shelves for the snow or for the rain or for the droppings of the birds. Why would he do that? It's beyond me. Uh, well, this is a picture with him uh, uh, working in, in his home, I guess. Anyway, look at this. Uh, at least here he uses the sloping roof, which is fine. I'm glad that finally he acknowledges, uh, but maybe he does it because he wants to connect with the old building, which did have a sloping roof. Uh, but these shelves, which you see here, I find them manneristic, manneristic uh, and, and, and totally unjustified, unless we are talking about graphics. That's all. They have no meaning to me. All these horizontal, do we see them in the old building? Of course not. No, I never saw a building built by the modest builders of villages all over the world, something like this. Why he did it, I have no idea. Uh, I really don't. Look at this. Now this would have been very nice if you placed here books or I don't know what else, but, but this is the outside of the building. Why would he do it? In my opinion, in a very futile way. There was no reason to do this unless he likes horizontal lines, you know, the sadism of horizontal lines or long lines, because that's, that's what we have here again. Um, in time, and again, the window is very low and very, I mean, look at the height of the window. This is a sadistic window. The landscape outside, it must be beautiful. I mean, you saw it. The mountains, it's, it's, it's nature. Why would you make this kind of... Uh, uh, contrived uh, sadistic window, which is maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 centimeters tall. I have no idea. I mean, look, he had enough space. No, I'm not against small windows. He could have made a little square window here and another one or a taller window, whatever. But this is a, a deterministic 
uh, window is a window that forces you to look in a certain way and only in that certain way. And I, I, I don't agree with this. It's, in my opinion, it's not that it's a mistake. It shows a, a, a malevolent willfulness. Maybe I'm, look at these people. I love these people and I love their building. Look at these windows. These windows are much wiser than what the Prisker Prize laureate Peter Sumtor did. He's pretentious and he's pretending. These people who knew nothing about architecture and built their hut, they did that with a beautiful modesty and the building has no, is nothing to blame in this building. But here I do blame the architect. This, this kind of window is unacceptable in a landscape I mean, maybe it would be acceptable in some, you know, difficult urban uh, context with uh, ugly surroundings, but this is not the case here. It's, it's, it's between, look, just mountains and trees and valleys, and it's a beautiful landscape. And look at these shelves towards the outside. Why did he do them? For what? Could anyone explain me? Because I don't understand look at them many of them and very long it's a mystery to me it's in my opinion the only reason he did them is because he likes these uh, many horizontal lines and their shadows you know in the drawing but uh, i am very sorry i never saw something like this in all the history of architecture and i'm not against the new but it's not about me in fact they are not even i mean visually they are not engaging or provocative in a good sense. They just show uh, this uh, linear mentality, you know, at work uh, and uh, in a very futile way, I actually not futile in a, in a malevolent way, because obviously in time, just as in the case of the chapel I showed previously, here snow will accumulate in time, this will curve, it will affect the world behind it and so on. Because again, we are dealing with Switzerland here. It's not, we are not in the desert. What I see here is really uh, the aesthetics of a rationalist who thinks that something like this would, will save the building from banality. It remains even less than banal. It is actually a, a, an example of how not to build, in my opinion. Now we arrive at this truly, this is considered his masterpiece. And it has some qualities, particularly in the, in, the, in the beauty of the plans that he drew. But in the reality of the building built, I still find some problems. And I don't think it's an accident that the most exciting pictures with, with this building are those where almost naked women show up. Why do you think they show up? Well, I didn't see such, for example, uh, Louis Kahn build the Trenton bath, you know, public bath, also a public bath. But I never saw pictures with, uh, you know, seductive uh, silhouettes in, uh, you know, with a building by Kahn. But in the case of the building by Peter Zumthor, they appear frequently. And in my opinion, they appear frequently because the building without these silhouettes it's quite cold and rational and rationalistic. This is the truth. And again, a flat roof, a flat roof, which is covered with grass. We see grass here as God made them on, made it on, on hills and uh, whatever. And I, I don't, I also think it's very problematic the way he used that grass because I don't know very well if I, I am, I am uh, sufficiently untired to explain well why it bothers me, but let, let, let's arrive at that picture. Uh, and I hope we will. Uh, we see here, we see, we see this gr grass, which grows on the, on the sloping uh, uh, land uh, on, on, on the hill. And then we see the grass here, which is also on, on, on nature. And then we see the grass by Peter Zumthor, which is the same grass. I mean, it is green, except that here the grass is uh, submits to the to the uh, sadistic will of the architect. In other words, the the horizontal surface of the terrace is covered with grass. 
but there is a mimic in here that I dislike. This is natural, this is natural, but this is unnatural. Being that here it is unnatural, personally, I would have used a different kind of covering. I would not have mimicked being in nature because obviously this building is not natural, it's very abstract and very rational and rationalistic. I think this is a mistake in terms of aesthetics, not just aesthetics, even the ethics of the building. Okay, make it rational. I think it would have been better if he would not have used grass here, but he used grass. Okay, this was his, his choice. Again, Peter Zumthor. You would not see such, a, such an image at the public bath by Louis Kahn that I mentioned. So there is a sens sensationalism. Now, of course, maybe he is not, uh, he didn't uh, uh, stage design the, the, this picture. It's possible. But the fact that someone, a photographer, felt the need for this is, I, to me, another proof that the building needing, needed the, the excitement of such sensuous figures because, because without it, the building would be uh, damped uh, to be relegated to a level of uh, uh, rationali rationalistic uh, architecture that is uh, uh, not very enticing and exciting. And I think this is the truth. In my opinion, the building is cold and is rational, is rationalistic. And uh, I still don't understand why the big, uh, the, you know, the big interest uh, this building uh, uh, stirred up. I, I, I really don't. I mean, what's so great? But now I turn against myself. I try to be objective. There are, there are good things here, and mainly in the graphic representation of, I like the plan of the building, and I hope I have the drawing here. But again, I have a problem with grass here and grass here because he's only mimicking here being so-called natural. He's not. And, and, and um, in, in, in maybe now I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, able to convey uh, properly what, what, what my intuition is, but I think this is a mistake. Uh, it is a mistake. This should have, like uh, Bernard Huet, for example, said that when, when he said within the city, uh, nature should be, should be uh, abstracted. Here, he's, he's not abstracting enough. He's, it, took, it, could have been, uh, it could have been abstracted if he didn't use grass, but he used grass. And uh, anyway, um, in my opinion, the building would have been much more convincing if this was concrete, just like or stone or whatever, you know, use something that the building was made of and show honestly how the building is. Don't mimic it being natural because it's not natural, Mr. Zumthor. Its geometry is not natural and nothing here is natural. So this is uh, very facile in my opinion. If this was grayish and cold, like, like, I think it would have been better. This is my, sorry for uh, allowing myself to be so-called uh, subjectively uh, passionate about criticizing Peter Sumter, but uh, this is what I feel. Uh, and uh, I could be wrong, of course. I, I like the plan, not so much in this. I hope I have other, other um, I, I like this, this uh, uh, you know, in a way, labyrinthine quality. Uh, um, the, 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 there was here the seed for a playfulness, which uh, maybe he was afraid to arrive at. At, at the extent it could, he could have arrived at. Um, somehow I have the, the uncomfortable feeling here that I am referring to uh, to the words of Winnie Mass that, uh, uh, you know, when he used a very unfortunate word, outsmarting nature. And I have the same feeling here that, that somehow uh, Peter Zumthor was, was uh, in a certain way uh, attempting consciously or unconsciously to outsmart nature. 
And I don't think we can do that. And I, I think if we are to relate to nature in a meaningful and appropriate way, we should uh, study uh, a little uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who had a, a genuine affection for, for nature and respect for nature. But, but if we come to graphic works, I like very much this work by, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, maybe a first intuition or maybe the drawing was done afterwards. I don't know. Uh, um, I, I like it uh, graphically, artistically. Uh, there are some interesting pictures that you can take in this place, maybe this labyrinth of, uh, you know, opaque walls and, and, and water and silhouettes. Uh, yes, you, you, could, uh, you could stage uh, interesting, taking interesting pictures. The plan is nice, although, I mean, it's nice because it has this fragmentation, which I like. But uh, on the other hand, it is the work of, of a rationalist. Look at even at the sections, you know, the, this, is, this is the work of a rationalist and we have to call him what he is. He is a rationalist. And I don't think you can have a, a, rational, a rationalist become a convincing mystic. Although again, the musicality of this drawing is beautiful. If he, if he could have kept this feeling of this drawing, which I truly like, is, I, I, you know, uh, I, I love this drawing. If he could have kept the spirit of this drawing more into the final building would have been great. But I don't think he did. Even this one. He is skillful, he has talent, he has something to say, but I, 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 I'm not so sure he he loves the earth and I'm not so sure he loves nature and I'm not so sure he loves life and I'm not so sure he loves himself. Although of that I'm not so sure that I was right in, in the last part. Um, yeah, you look at the building and then when you turn back to this drawing, uh, it, it's a different feeling, I think. The building is too slick in a way. And the big uh, glass surfaces also, uh, I'm not talking about the, 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 the pain, uh, those who have to clean those large pieces of glass have to go through. You know, I'm not talking about this, but the kind of fragmentation, mysterious fragmentation that we see here, we don't see it any longer here. This is a, an imposing building kind of, uh, doing an imposition on nature in, in the, uh, look at this uh, fence here, which was done probably not by him. It, it was maybe there from, you know, it, in its fragility suggests something else. This building is uh, oppressive. I mean, on this facade. And look at the grass and look at the walls by Peter Sumptor. Now this grass, has the grace of God, has, is, is, is sensitive, is delicate, is fragile. But this building is not. This building is here to last. This is a, is a triumphalist building, despite the fact that the drawing I showed is, uh, shows a fragmentation, which I like very much, but I don't see it here. And look at it, it's, it's, it's the triumph of, of, of Cartesian thinking uh, it's this uh, this prism that has some openings, is true, but kind of regular, and uh, it's it, that's why you know what is above is a mimicking effort. You know, you put grass on it, Mister Zumtor, but in essence, you still say I am uh, outsmarting you, uh, dear nature, or without dear. This is what I see. The Serpentine Gallery. Now, this is also a work which intrigues me. And uh, let me see if I can articulate now my thoughts in relation with it. What he did here, he turned his back with his building towards the park, the, the pavilion finds itself in, towards promoting some kind of introversion. You just look towards this island uh, oasis of uh, more or less wild nature, but this so-called wild nature is still condemned to be contained within a rectangle. So people sit here and they look at the nature as Peter Zumthor wants them to look at. 
But what bothers me about this building, which has some, again, some beautiful drawings, watercolors, and we are going to see them, I hope. Here it is one example. I like, I like these watercolors, as I like the one for the previous building. I, I like his watercolors, and uh, uh, um, I, I only regret that some of the sensitivity of the graphic work I don't truly really find uh, in, in his built work. Again, we see uh, uh, surrealism, not surrealism, not S-U-R, but S-E-R, you know, um, coming from serious. It's, it's, a, it's a rationalist approach to architecture is, you know, uh, uh, the elements are predictably following one after the other. But what, what is very problematic, I think, uh, is, um, I hope I arrive at the, Yes. Now look at this. So this building is supposed to, in a way, pay homage and celebrate nature, right? Because that's what we have inside. No, we have flowers. He hired the landscape architect to, 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 to create this uh, uh, beautiful uh, display of, of, of flowers and nature. Although, as I said, they are contained within a rectangle. So again, the oppressive man who wants to outsmart nature does here the same thing. He wants to promote the wildness of nature, but actually he contains that nature within a, a rectangle. But what is bothering is the insult to the park. So this tree is not nature. This tree is not nature. This grass is not nature. Why is he turning the back of his buildings, meaning his back, on this nature? He seems to say that the only nature that matters is the one that he manipulated within the courtyard of his building. I find this very insulting to the park. It really is. I mean, it's a black wall, blank, sterile, frigid, turned towards the brothers and sisters of the flowers that he displays inside. Or what else are these, the trees here, and probably some other plants and bushes and the grass. It's very insulting, I think. Insulting, how could you place such a building, even if it is a temporary building, within a park? You know, and very arrogantly claim that only what is inside the building, inside the courtyard matters. Meaning, uh, uh, sorry, um, meaning what is here. So all, the, all the, the eyes are oriented towards this. And it's true, these are beautiful. But are they more beautiful than, than, than these trees here outside? Why do they receive a, such an unpleasant uh, treatment? Meaning, you know, the, the back being, turning its back towards them, you know. This is not a building. When I see this, I don't see love of nature. Look at these trees. Are they less beautiful than the flowers inside? No, they are not less beautiful. They are equally beautiful. On the other hand, the design of this, this path, you know, is rather simplistic and almost cartoon-like. I, I, again, I, I don't think this is very sensitive. So, I have reservations about this man. Uh, again, he wants to show it's when I look at this plan and I saw pictures of what he built, I get this meaning. This this is what I think. He wants to show us the, the beauty of the of nature. He brings in a, a, a skillful uh, landscape designer or horticulturist culturist to, to, to bring in plants flowers to create a beautiful core for this uh, pavilion. Fine. But equally, he turns his back. All this building is saying no to everything around it. And if here there was a highway, I would have said it's fine. But this is not a highway with many cars and dust and noise. It's park. So what is this man trying to tell us? that only his vision of nature is the correct one, and that these trees are meaningless and uh, 
they deserve just to have one's back turned towards them. I, 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 I don't follow him and I will not follow him. I love nature. I love nature inside and outside. I, I love nature inside his pavilion, but also outside. Uh, it's something perverse here, you know. Um, I don't trust this man. I am very honest with you. I don't trust him. Uh, it's something about him that I, I have serious doubts about him. Uh, now, this drawing is not so nice as, as the, the previous ones. Maybe, well, he used markers here. I think he's much better when he uses watercolors. Again, this grayness and blackness, I'm tired of them. I really am. But this I like. Although, when I contemplate the section, what do I see? All eyes towards the center and all the backs turn towards what is outside. To me, this shows misanthropy. I don't know if you can use the word misanthropy when you relate to nature in negative terms. Probably not. But maybe we could, uh, with a poetical license, license, say, okay, he was misanthropic towards nature. Uh, although the, the um, ambiguity derives from the fact that here he seems to advocate towards the center of the building, love of nature. But then why would he turn his back towards the park? Uh, I don't know. Maybe arrogantly he thinks that only his vision of nature is the correct one and the park it represents, uh, you know, uh, a configuration that uh, doesn't receive, doesn't need, doesn't deserve to receive attention, maybe. But a beautiful picture, thanks to the tree outside of the building uh, and its shadow. Uh, otherwise, the building is not as interesting as this picture shows. The picture shows something interesting exactly because of what he neglected. The tree outside which generously and in an inspiring way throws a shadow on his blank wall. Um, narrow pathways, you know, again, in my opinion, rather sadistic, but the flowers are beautiful. Indeed, these flowers are beautiful because, because the creator who made them uh, was, was inspired and beautiful. Uh, what can I say? I wish Peter Zumthor had the same generosity as uh, God had when he made these flowers. Uh, I don't think he does. And here is the man, uh, the mystic. Uh, and uh, I, yes. Now here is the, you know, would you say that this man is not a lover of uh, publicity? But look at those uh, paparazzis on the left. You know, I mean, you could say he didn't invite them there. I don't know. Uh, maybe he didn't. But I think, uh, I think he enjoys them. And uh, anyway. <laughs> you know, it makes me smile actually because, because this man is assuming the position of some kind of a prophet and he's not. You know, if, if, if we are to have a prophet here, I would, I would gladly go from, for the qualities of this tree. Yes, the, 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 uh, the tree, yes, the tree I would listen to, but not to this man who insults the park with this uh, black, blank, banal wall, no. Sorry, Mr. Zumthor, and the black lily. Now we arrive at the work with which he insulted the Venice Biennial uh, five years ago, I think. And I saw that Venice Biennial, and I knew that he was showing a work there. It was hard to discover it because it was hidden by a row of uh, clothes coming from South Korea. I don't know what, why those clothes were there. Anyway, we'll arrive at pictures with a black lily, as he called it. Now, is the lily supposed to be black? I don't know enough about lilies, but it's something about, again, this blackness which turns me off. And I like black, don't get me wrong. But uh, it's, it's something about his blackness that turns me off. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art, he brought to, he sent to the Venice Biennial a, a large fragment of a 1 to 10 scale 
of the model for this museum. But what was bizarre is that 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 particular Venice Biennial was uh, its theme was building for the poor. This this project had nothing to do with that. Absolutely nothing. It was the County Museum of Art for a flamboyant North American city. Okay, he sent that thing, but we are going to see it. This is what he, you know, th this is a, a model of that, of that, uh, um, you know, project for Los Angeles, which I understood received opposition from the community who had better sense than the architect. Now, I don't know what this black thing is, maybe some black ink fell on the 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 model i don't know and it's not important but maybe it's an accident that tells us something it's a huge building he proposed for los angeles and in my opinion very aggressive although it has curves it's true it's curved but it's huge and uh, i would say rather banal as architecture. The renderings, of course, like just like the pictures within that celebrated uh, public bath in Switzerland, are animated by uh, seductive silhouettes, usually women, very slim and slender and dressed or undressed in a, in a visually pleasing way. Uh, of course, these are just renderings, but even the renderings say something, you know, why do we need the excitement of certain silhouettes if the building is exciting by itself. If I look at renderings by Frank Lloyd Wright, since I mentioned him already, I don't see such things, expensive cars or seductive silhouettes, no. But in, if you remove these silhouettes from here, what actually do we get? A banal ceiling, a, ba a banal uh, slab, banal walls. If you remove the art, you just get a very, very uh, prosaic building, in my opinion. Again, you know, uh, uh, another another rendering, you know, where the reddish hair in the in the foreground, or or the shopping shopping bag, right? We need a shopping bag. We need uh, we need these uh, these things to animate the building. And look at the look at the model. Look at finally, we see many people working here. You know. Uh, and uh, really, I, I, maybe I'm blind, but I don't see what is the greatness of this, if it is to be built. Hopefully, in my opinion, it shouldn't be built. Uh, even in terms of curvatures, I, I find it's something cartoonish about it, in my opinion. What is not cartoonish and is actually threatening is the size of the building. It's huge. But who knows? I am open to the idea that maybe I'm wrong and maybe I, I don't perceive the intentions of the architect properly. Uh, although I, I have seen a, a, a large portion of this in Venice, one to 10, very, very black. Um, I understood, I, I saw some reports that apparently he changed from blackness to whiteness, he kept the shape uh, I don't know what is, the, I, I prepared this material two years ago, and I don't know if what happened since then to this project. Uh, here he is. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Zumthor. Uh, as long as you like it, I guess it's okay, but I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything, uh, um, you know, really remarkable about this building. I, I, I don't. Uh, even the drawing itself, I have seen the more sensitive watercolors uh, done previously. I mean, we saw previously, but here maybe, you know, a, uh, an exacerbated uh, uh, amount of success uh, made you even graphically to be a little, little, a little less sensitive is possible. So uh, the Venice Biennial in 2016, as I said, five years ago, he brought you can, you can imagine with what expenditures to bring a model which was one to 10, I mean, a very large piece of, 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 of the model uh, occupying a large space just to send it to Venice. It was probably a fortune just to spend to send it there. 
you know, and uh, ironically and sadly, the theme of the biennial, that biennial was, you know, uh, the architecture of the poor, building for the poor. Here it is. Didn't I say it was hidden by, uh, I don't know exactly what this, what was the meaning of all these, uh, you know, clothes, uh, you know, in various shades of colors here, but behind them was, was this fragment of, of, of his building for, for Venice. In my opinion, it was a frivolous and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, sad uh, uh, expenditure here, you know. Uh, when, I, when I think about something like this, and, 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 and the bad thing was that, again, the theme of this biennial was building for the poor. I mean, I'm absolutely sure hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent for this nonsense. So Mr. Peter Zumtor, you know, sent his uh, museum, I mean, a fragment of his museum to Venice. What for? The, the architecture is very banal, as you can see, and, uh, and uh, you know, had no relationship, as I said, to the theme of the biennial. Very strange, but such, uh, extravagant um, and unnecessary expenditures uh, happen all the time uh, at the biennials in Venice and in, at other, you know, because it is a club, because the star architects are part of that club and they are invited, doesn't matter what, doesn't matter if they have a concern for the theme of the, of the, the exhibition or not. So, uh, you know, Mr. Tsumtor from his village of 100 people uh, sent this thing uh, or um, manufactured it for, for this particular event, it's possible. I mean, look, it's huge, you know. Where are you to make it if you are to make it, you know, to uh, where do you house it? It's a problem. You see the silhouette of, of human beings, so it's, it's, it's big. And uh, it's big, but I don't think if it has other qualities, if bigness is indeed a, a quality. Anyway, um, I like the Venice Biennial and, uh, you know, they have their role, but, but often there is a lot of, uh, a lot of noise, the visual or otherwise, which costs a lot of money and, uh, you wonder, you know, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of this meaningless building being brought to, to Venice? If there is a meaning here, I see meaning in the carpentry at the top, the roof of the, of the old stru existing structure. Here, yes, I see, but not here. I'm sorry, Mr. Tsumtor, I really am. And here is the black lily. Uh, I, it was probably not built and I hope it will not be built. I really hope so. Uh, we have enough blackness in the world. We don't need uh, his, uh, his black lily, I think. Here it is. <laughs> and the interior, you know, again, if you remove the paintings, what do you get? What do you stare at? Nothing. There is nothing here to stare at. If you go at the Guggenheim Museum, even if there is no art, you still stare at the complexity and beauty and the dynamic qualities of the building. Here, there is nothing of the sort. Just try to remove in your imagination the paintings and look at the people staring at what? Staring at nothing. There is nothing to stare at. Otherwise, of course, the kids from a classroom are uh, happily going to, to the museum and so on. Thank you very much and happy birthday, uh, Peter Sumtor.